Southern California racetrack practitioner by trade and has served at the highest levels for organizations including the American Association of Equine Practitioners, the Grayson Jockey Club Research Committee, Karma, and the Equine Health and Safety Board. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jeff Blea. Hi, buddy. How you doing, Pat? I'm good, Chris. How are you? She is not only a veterinary practitioner, but she's an attorney as well, a vet and an attorney. And just for fun, she runs marathons. <laughs> her work uh, has brought her full circle as she began with uh, the New York Racing Association, which led her to the CHRB, then on to Director of Racing for the Massachusetts Gaming Commission, and back to Naira as the Chief Examining Veterinarian and now the Jockey Club Steward for the New York Racing Association tracks. Please welcome Dr. Jennifer Durenberger. When's your, uh, when's your, she had, a, she ran so many marathons, you, you, you just hurt your hips and that was it. And, uh, Currently on the vets list. Now you're getting back? <laughs> yeah. Very good. Well, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm gunning for the New York Marathon next October. Thank you. Couldn't do it this year. I twisted my ankle. Uh, he was a racetrack practitioner prior to entering the world of corporate law and equine research, focusing extensively on EIPH, or exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhaging. He is the co-inventor of Flare Equine Nasal Strips and is currently the CEO of BioVisix Medical, which is pioneering therapies in human degenerative, degenerative retinal diseases. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Jim Chapetta. <laughs> All right, Dr. Blair, the stage is yours, and after that, uh, we'll, we'll take some questions. Thank you, Tom, for the introduction. Can everybody hear okay? Uh, first of all, we want to thank the uh, Haggard, Davidson, McGee for sponsoring this event. We really do appreciate it and the time to talk about some veterinary issues. Uh, this is a very important conference, and I've been able to listen to some of it and been, have been very, very impressed. When they asked me to do this, uh, they asked me to talk about the fetlock. So I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And one of the best talks I ever heard about the fetlock was given by Dr. Larry Bramlage at the AAP about 10 years ago. And I said, oh, great, I'd be happy to do this. And, but you only have about 10 minutes to talk. I said, well, Dr. Brownlee spoke for three hours, so this is going to be a different, a different animal. So then he said, well, why don't you talk about common injuries in the racehorse and what you do or what can be done to return those horses back into training if it can be done. So my talk is based on racehorse injuries, what we see kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. I practice here at Santa Anita. Uh, I've been on the backside all day today. Went home and put on a tie so it would look nice. Uh, but I like this slide. And the reason I like this, this little slide, and it comes from the Stolen Horse International, is because it talks about why we're all here. Um, at the end of it, when you take a step back, it's not just about the horses. It's about love, life, and learning. And I think the horse encompasses what we do in our everyday lives. And we sometimes tend to forget that. So moving forward on with racehorse injuries, I'll kind of, it's going to be a quick overview. I'll start with the front end and move my way to the back end, first with uh, bone injuries and then soft tissue injuries. Humeral stress fractures, uh, can you all see that on your screen in front of you? I don't have a pointer, but if you look at this, this is a humeral stress fracture. It's very, it's a, an injury we see usually in horses that are coming off a layoff. So they've been turned out, or young horses just coming to the track. They've been galloping for a while. They start their, spree, their speed works, get up to three-eighths, half a mile. And then you'll, see, you'll start to see a lameness. It'll, get, it'll be very subtle at first, and then the horses will get sound. They'll work again, and they'll become very lame. Uh, they're difficult to identify radiographically. You have to follow this horse's history, and you have to have good communication with the trainer as to what this horse has been doing. The best way to diagnose these is with nuclear scintigraphy. We actually have a scintigraphy unit here on the backside at Santa Anita. And if you look at this uh, slide in the middle, the top middle of the tic-tac-toe slide, there's a really dark spot. 
Uh, at the top of it is a scapula, the bottom bone is a humerus, that black spot is a humeral stress fracture, and it's, an, uh, it's actually bilateral, this horse, meaning it's in both legs. So the, the radiopharmaceutical is absorbed by the bone that's trying to remodel, and that's where we identify these stress fractures. They can be prevented. Uh, it takes some training management and some good horsemanship. Uh, treatment for these is rest time. They do come back and race. Typically, we give these horses four months off. Uh, if we were in Kentucky, they would probably walk for 30 to 60 days and then go to a full turnout so the bone can remodel. In California, it's a more difficult process due to land limitations, so we end up turning them out for a full four months. Moving down the leg, well, look at the knee. On your left of your screen is what we call uh, third carpal bone sclerosis. Again, I don't have a pointer, but if you look at the edge of the third carpal bone, you see a change in the density. So what that bone is doing is it's remodeling. You gotta remember, bone is dynamic. It's always changing. It changes in response to stress or exercise. So if you, this horse clinically will show some filling or effusion in a knee, some heat, may show mild to moderate lameness. Uh, the rider may pick it up. The trainer may notice there's a change. Uh, you have, I tend to be pretty aggressive with these as far as diagnosing them and probably overcautious because if you go too far and don't let this third carpal bone remodel the way it should, you end up with the slide on the right. And if you look at that bone at the bottom of that x-ray, you could see a semicircular or half moon. That's the third carpal slab bone and a third carpal slab. What ends up happening is now this horse has a fracture in that third carpal bone, requires a screw fixation. Depending on how much damage is done to that joint will determine the prognosis of whether that horse returns to racing or not. So I tend to, when I get to that slide on the left, I tend to get pretty aggressive about management so I don't get to the slide on the right. Chip fractures in the knee are very common, uh, not so much in thoroughbreds as they are in quarter horses, but we do see them quite frequently. Slide to your left is a chip in the top joint. Uh, you hear comments like, is it floating, is it free? Well, once they chip, they're a chip. Uh, floating is a misnomer in my opinion. They're either embedded in the cartilage or they're still attached to the cartilage. The slide on the right, you could see a chip in the, what we call the lower joint or the intercarpal joint. It's a small chip. Both of these horses were operated they were both given 60 to 90 days off and returned uh, to training and racing and both did well. They told me this has an itchy trigger finger. Okay. Moving down to the fetlock, this is one of our most uh, frustrating problems we have. On the slide to your left is a lateral condylar fracture. You hear of condylar fractures all the time. This is what we call a complete non-displaced. In other words, it starts in the joint, the fetlock joint, and it migrates up and breaks out on the side of the cannon bone. Sometimes it will start at the bottom of the joint, migrate, and go right back up and spiral up. Those become very, very dangerous as far as recovery from surgery. These are repaired very commonly. Uh, they're repaired very uh, uneventfully. Recoveries are, pretty, are very smooth. The slide to the right is a different horse, but it's showing you a screw fixation of a condylar fracture. Uh, the horse on the right and the left actually both actually return to training and racing successfully. They take about four to six months out. The screws generally do come out. In California, we find that taking all the screws out, uh, we have less of a problem down the line. I know on the East Coast, they tend to leave the bottom screw or the bottom two screws in. Lateral condylar fracture on your left. These are, these are frustrating because the horse is lame, locks to the ankle joint, we radiographic, we don't see anything. We wait 10 days to two weeks for that bone to remodel. We'll radiograph it again. We'll see a change in that condyle. So we know there's a condylar fracture that's impending. That's evident by the slide on your right. If you look at that bone, there's a little uh, dark area right above the joint. And that's indicative of a, con of a condylar fracture that's about to happen. So we can prevent a lot of these things with management and very attentive care, as well as modern day diagnostics. Sesamoid fractures, sesamoids are the silent killers. Uh, they're often not found until they fracture. Um, the slide on your left is an apical sesamoid bone. Same thing on your right. These horses will, 
these horses will come back and race, depending on how much damage is done to the suspensory branch, which attaches to that top of that sesamoid uh, bone. We call these apical. You can take them out, surgically remove them. If the suspensory is not damaged, they will come back and race successfully. They're difficult to diagnose, even with scintigraphy. Uh, we have a new uh, diagnostic modality coming to Santa Anita. It's in development currently at UC Davis. Uh, thanks to the sponsorship of the Stronic Group and Dolly Green Research Foundation and the Southern California Equine Foundation, we should have a PET positron emission tomography unit on the backside, <clears throat> I'm guesstimating the beginning of the year, which I think will help us tremendously or prevent these type of injuries. In addition to that, here in Southern California, we're looking at an MRI unit, which can also help identify these before they reach the point where they need surgery. Okay, moving on to other sesamoid issues. Uh, slide on your left, the sesamoid on your left, there's a dark spot in the middle of it that's demineralized, that's bone pathology. That horse will have a problem with that sesamoid. Slide on your right, the sesamoid that's on the left side of the, of the radiograph. Again, you see the change in the density of that bone. That's indicating that bone is remodeling, is not healthy, and we need to intervene before this horse has either a significant fracture or a catastrophic injury of that fetlock. Moving to the hind end, the tibial stress fractures, we all hear about them quite frankly, frequently. They're similar to shin fractures in young horses. In the centigraphy uh, uh, photograph on your left, the top center uh, segment there, you can see a dark spot. Again, that's indicative of a stress fracture. These horses will be lame for two to three days, start to get sound and they go back to training and then they'll come up lame again. You can radiograph them as seen on the right. There's a change in the density in the caudal aspect of that tibia, but the definitive diagnosis without a visible fracture line is nuclear scintigraphy. Pelvic fractures do occur. Oftentimes when breaking from the, great, the gate, ground breaks away from underneath them, you'll get, end up with a pelvic fracture. You can ultrasound them and diagnose them, but definitively they're uh, diagnosed via nuclear scintigraphy. I like to wait 10 to 14 days, at, at least seven to 10 days after an injury before going to uh, scintigraphy because it takes a little while for that bone to remodel and for that radionuclear tide to get uptake into that bone. We use technetium here in, at Santa Anita. Uh, a couple little fun x-rays, foot, don't forget the feet, no foot, no foot, horse. Uh, you keep working on it, you keep soaking on it, the trainer gets a little annoyed. You keep telling him to soak it. After soaking it for two weeks, everybody is about ready to kill you. Then you x-ray the horse, and lo and behold, he has a coffin bone fracture. The one on the right is kind of an interesting one. I've had a couple of these in the last two years. It's a P3 or coffin bone fracture with side bone. The side bone is something you see in older horses. The coffin bone fracture is not. Uh, these horses do fine. We shoe these horses with full, sh uh, full uh, bar shoes with clips turn them out for four months and they will heal. Uh, bone, think bone, four months, four letters, four months. Soft tissue, uh, real quickly, we're looking at the suspensory branch on your left. Uh, the suspensory bifurcates in the lower two thirds of the leg and attaches to the top portion of each sesamoid. The ultrasound on your left, you could see the measurements, uh, the image on the left side of the left image versus the right side of the left image. The right side is markedly enlarged and there's some dark areas or hypoechoic areas. Ultrasound is opposite of radiographs where you see black on ultrasound, that's usually lack of tissue and integument or tearing of tissue. The right sided ultrasound is just normal attachment. I'm showing you here where those suspensory branches attach to the sesamoid bones. If you look at that image in the middle of both of those uh, views is a white sharp white line or kind of a contour, that's actually the sesamoid bone. So you can see how that attachment works. And if there is some pulling or avulsion, you can uh, definitively diagnose that with ultrasound. More suspensory desmitis, which is inflammation of the suspensory. Uh, on the right is an image of distal sesamoidian ligaments, which are the ligaments in the pastern. Uh, they are difficult to diagnose. They are rare, but they can be definitively diagnosed with ultrasound. Both of these conditions will come back in race with time 
and with early and accurate diagnosis. High suspensory, everybody talks about high suspensories. Uh, we see them. I don't think you see them as much as people think you see them. Definitively, you can diagnose them with ultrasound on your right. Uh, if you look at that suspensory, which is a lower part of that image, there's a dark area, which is hypoechoic, which indicates there's some tearing in that suspensory body. If you look at the corresponding nuclear scintigraphy image, there's a dark area right below the knee, right where that attaches, and that's an avulsion or a high suspensory lesion that's pulling off a piece of the bone. These horses will also heal. They'll do fine with time. I'll give these horses four to six months. Shockwave helps these horses quite a bit, especially during the convalescent period. There's been quite a bit of work done with uh, PRP and stem cells, and that also provides some benefit to not only high suspensories, but suspensory branch lesions as far as healing and prognosis. Tendons, uh, Gary Jones said a long time ago, what do you do with, the, uh, with a horse with a tendon? His response was you sell the part that's attached to the tendon. They're difficult. Uh, time, time, time. I'm very conservative. I give horses with bow tendons, and I call these core lesions. Both images on the screen have a core lesion. I'll give them as much time as I can, eight to 10 months. And if you're any sooner than that, you're fooling yourself. You can shockwave these. You can inject them with PRP. You can inject them with stem cells. You can try IRAP. That's become a little bit of uh, in, in vogue. Time. Two most important things with tendon are time and how you bring them back. When they come back, they're going to go through a cyclical up and down. They're going to flare up. When they flare up, let them quiet down. When they quiet down, press forward. When they flare up again, let them quiet down. Time and your rehab are your two most critical issues with tendons, rehab, and bringing them back. Okay, these are just other examples of tendons. Uh, edge lesions are more difficult to return to training than our core lesions, in my opinion. Could you advance the slide? There's the, there we go. Okay. Last slide. We'll leave questions to the end. I, I tried to run through some of just the highlights. There's a lot more to talk about rehab treatment. Uh, the bottom line is a lot of these horses that have injuries, they're athletes. Just like if you look at the Sunday morning paper on the injured reserve list, these horses will have injuries. Early diagnosis, good management, good treatment, and time, they usually come back to the races and, and run successfully. And that's all I have. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Durenberg. Okay. And can you all hear me? Because I'm a little bit of a low talker, but we're good. Um, I've been in and out the last two days, and I just want to take a minute and reflect on, I talk at a lot of industry conferences, and I just want you guys to know that the panelists and the moderators that you've heard from in the last two days are top of their game. Um, just some really incredible people have come through here to talk to you, and the reason they do that is because they love what they do. They love this industry. It's the same reason I'm here. And this industry has given so much back to those of us who've chosen to, to be a part of it. So I'm so glad you're here. I wish there were more of you. Uh, but those of you that are here, uh, we're so, so grateful to have you. I have slides as well. I'm an academic. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. They're more to keep me on track, or I will talk to you until 10 o'clock tonight. <laughs> so this is just bullet points. If anyone's really interested, I can get all the material for you at any point. Um, but. I'm here to talk to you about the role of the regulatory veterinarian. And uh, before I talk about that, I just want to put it in context. So if you haven't seen this website, this is calracingcares.com. I encourage you to go there. Um, this was set up a couple of years ago. I was involved in some of the initial content. It's been updated uh, to reflect the current state of the industry. But there's a lot of really, really good high-level information in here. Um, including things like Meet the Team. And if you were to click on Meet the Team, you would see many things, including this picture here, um, with the stable workers. So who takes care of racehorses, right? And that's important for what the regulatory vet's role is. So obviously owners, the trainers, we've got private practitioners, 
We've got a lot of therapists now. And the groom, who's really the horse's personal attendant, right? So we have a whole team of people that are looking out for these horses on a daily basis. So the question really is, you know, why do we need these other veterinarians in the loop? And what we do, this is a highly regulated industry. There's a lot of money involved. There's a lot of money invested on your half. And there's a lot of money wagered on the parimutuel customer's half. So just like those of you who are in banking or energy or any of these other highly regulated industries, there is a ton of rules out there. All right, so we've got these regulatory veterinarians. And the model rule, which is just a guide that all the different states can use and look to, uh, it says that the regulatory vets are in charge of ensuring the health and welfare of racehorses and to safeguard the interests of the public and the participants of racing. And that's a big task, um, as you can imagine. Um, we talk about a level playing field. And so this is really where we fit in. And we don't just think about ourselves in the context as veterinarians and just working for the horse, because we work for you guys as well. So what we do is we want to make sure that the health and safety of all participants, so that's the horses, that's the riders, that's the people who work with the horses on a daily basis, that the health and safety isn't jeopardized for the sake of winning. We also want the best horse to have the opportunity to win on that day. We want to safeguard your return on investment. We also heard from breeders, and we want to make sure that breeders' decisions are made with the confidence that past performances accurately reflect that horse's true athletic capability. We don't want the asterisk next to the horse's name. And we want to make sure that the betting public is wagering on a reasonably consistent product. Now, it is gambling, and a lot can happen out there, and these are very, very large athletic animals, uh, and there are people involved. And so anything can happen. The best horse doesn't always win, right? But we want to make sure that the betting public is at least wagering on a reasonably consistent product. So what is our role? And first and foremost, what we do is we say time out, OK? We flag horses for further evaluation. This is very different than what Dr. Blea does. We don't diagnose, treat, or prescribe. We just say, hey, time out you need to have someone come and evaluate this horse. We do that using our professional judgment and our practical experience. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of rules. And we are racing officials, so we are responsible for making sure that the rules are followed. And those rules have to do with medication. They have to do with veterinary practices. They have to do with the care and treatment of the racehorses. There's a whole bunch of things we're involved in. I'm not going to go through them and bore you. I'm going to pick one out that I think is the most interesting for most groups that I talk to. And that is, yeah, we do sometimes remove horses from competition. Sometimes you're all set to go. And as we heard from an owner on the previous panel, you're in your box. You've got your family and your friends there. And all of a sudden, you find out you're not racing today. Um, and we recognize that that is a very uncomfortable situation. So I'm going to talk about how that happens. We don't second guess. We're not in the second guessing business, OK? So we don't second guess what the trainers are doing. We don't second guess what the private practitioners are doing. We don't second guess what the riders are doing when they're warming up the horses. But you heard a lot um, from Dr. Blaya's slides about stress fractures. Stress fractures are pre-existing injuries that go on to become worse. And stress fractures are an insidious business, OK? We see the horses at discrete periods of time, maybe every two weeks, every three weeks, every six weeks, every eight weeks. But what happens when there's a stress fracture, and I speak from experience, Mr. Durkin introduced me. Um, I had a very serious stress fracture this winter. And the first sign was subtle. I didn't really think anything of it. Never in my mind thought that it was a fracture. But my body tried to protect itself. And I'm quite sure when I was running that I changed the way I moved. And you don't necessarily see that on a daily basis. It's hard to pick out. It's so subtle. And let's not forget that horses are animals who are very protective of themselves. And they don't want to show weakness, right? I mean, these are, these are herd animals. And so they don't want to show pain. They don't want to show people that something's wrong or other animals that something is wrong. And so the changes that start to begin 
as the bone is starting to weaken. It's very, very subtle. And sometimes just coming in and seeing this horse a snapshot in time, three weeks now from three weeks ago, we're able to pick up on some of those subtle differences that the people that work on a day-to-day -day basis might not. All we do in the morning when we go out and we look at every horse that's entered to race on any given day is we have our hands and our eyes. Now those are very good diagnostic tools. Dr. Glea certainly wouldn't want to be without them, but we don't have diagnostic equipment, okay? However, we also have our clinical experience doing this and we do this upwards of 5,000 times a year. So 5,000 times a year I go and I look at a horse in the morning, I have my hands on the horse, I watch the horse jog, I watch the horse behind the starting gate and I know how he finished the race, he or she finished the race. And so they say if you do something X number of times you become really good at it, an expert. I'll never call myself an expert, but I have a lot of experience looking at horses in the morning and knowing what the outcome is in the afternoon. I'll also tell you, as somebody who has worked in multiple jurisdictions and has visited with regulatory veterinarians around the world, including Hong Kong, regulatory vets are remarkably consistent in what they see and, and where the bar is. And you'll hear a lot of chatter on the racetrack about how you know they'll, they'll want a good cop, bad cop you, but in general, regulatory vets are really consistent at, at what they do and how they flag horses for further evaluation. We don't like scratching horses. Scratching, if you don't know, means taking them out of competition. We don't like to do that. But it's certainly better than the alternative. We never want to put ourselves or any of you or any of the riders in a situation where we say, you know, this might be something or it might be nothing. So let's go put them in the starting gate and see what we got. Like we're never going to do that. We're always going to err on the side of caution. And I know that that can be frustrating when it's all systems go but sometimes it's the right choice to make. And so I wanna just share with you, how often does this happen, right? How often as an owner can you expect your horse to be scratched? This is data from New York in 2018. It's an entire calendar year. The regulatory veterinary team there scratched horses in the morning, so following pre-race inspection, 125 times, okay? The average horse that came back to return to race didn't come back for 89 days. And I would argue that if that horse was ready to go on that day, all systems go, um, that we would have seen him sooner than that. The average return to race in New York, I don't have a number for you. It depends obviously on the type of horse, claiming horse, stakes horse, all of that plays into it, but it's certainly sooner than 89 days. And that's the average. And this button, okay. Now, 10% of those who do return to race had an adverse event from the veterinary perspective, which means they were either vanned off or they returned lame in that first race back. 34% of the horses we scratched in the morning had a subsequent six month or more layoff. And you heard about the times that Dr. Blea suggested for the healing of some surgery or even just healing of some of these lesions that fits with that. So 34% of these horses had a six month or more layoff, which is Great, because what it means is that the system worked, the team worked. We said time out, we flagged the horse for further evaluation, the veterinarian got the private practitioner involved, a diagnosis was made, and there was a treatment plan, and there we go. And that's, that's how this whole system is supposed to work. 18% of these horses never raced again. Now in the afternoon, right, horses will go out there, they get the riders up and they go in the post parade, they warm up. We did also scratch an additional 51 horses behind the gate that year. And the numbers are really similar. The average return to race was 94 days. 9% of those, exactly the same statistic as the earlier group. A third of them, six month and more layoff and 16% never raced again. Now how is, does this fit in the big picture? We had, I think, just under 15,000 starts in New York last year, and so, <laughs> somewhere in here, uh, there we go, all right. So 0.83% of the time in the morning, 0.34% in the afternoon. So 1% of the time, you can expect, if you make 100 starts as an owner, that one of those 100 starts, your horse may be scratched. That's just an average from one jurisdiction, but again, it's pretty consistent with other jurisdictions that I've worked in. So it's not a common event, but it is something to be taken seriously. 
when we do that. And I think that might be all I have. Um, what does our day look like? The regulatory vets all over the country are involved in different stuff. So I'm not gonna go through this with you, but we have a lot of duties in addition to the pre-race inspections. We have a lot of tracks that are watching morning training. Uh, we do out of competition testing. We do the post-race testing. We do furosemide administration, which is Lasix. Uh, and of course, we're on track um, for any emergencies and in the paddock. So that is a day in the life of a regulatory veterinarian. Dr. Kitata, next slide. Great, thank you. <clears throat> We're gonna talk about the respiratory system. Dr. Blaya made a comment, no foot, no horse. <clears throat> My feeling is no lungs, it really doesn't matter how many feet they have. You need to be able to breathe. <laughs> the respiratory system is a really interesting system because it's pretty simple. It's just a bunch of tubes that bring air in from the outside and transfer it to the blood but it's subjected to a lot of physiological forces, a lot of pathological forces, and a lot of concussion forces that both can cause problems, but also help the system function. So we're gonna talk about the function and the structure of the respiratory system. We'll talk about some common ailments. Think to bear in mind, it is one of the, it is the number two reason that horses are retired from performance. So the respiratory system, primary function is to provide oxygen, and give that oxygen to the muscle and the body to do work and to get rid of carbon dioxide, which is a waste gas. It's also important in body temperature control as well as acting as a filter for particles in the blood. When we look at the respiratory system, it's pretty easy to break it down into two systems for discussion. We'll talk about the upper airways and the lower airways. The upper airways include the nasal passages, the nostril, the throat, and then that long tube called the trachea, and then the lower airways are the lungs. Why do you need it? Well, because we need to get oxygen in, because nothing happens without oxygen. And the way that happens is oxygen that's contained in the air comes into the lungs. From the lungs, it jumps onto red blood cells, and the heart pumps that around and brings it to the muscles. Horses' muscles are adapted to carry a lot of starch or sugar that is then uses the oxygen to create a molecule called ATP. And that molecule is what makes it happen. That's what makes the muscles contract. Without oxygen, none of this happens. So how do they get oxygen? They take in an awful lot of air. When a horse is galloping, they take in about two, four gallons of buckets of air per second, which if you do the calculations, about six 60 gallon bathtubs. So it's a lot of air that they're bringing in every minute. But they do it through this tube structure. And so when you're talking about tubes and you're talking about moving a lot of air in, and you have a lot of vacuum pressures to pull that air in, you gotta talk about resistance. And the resistance that occurs in bringing that air in, about 50% of it occurs up in the nasal passages. Another 10 to 25% occurs back in the throat. And then 25 to 40% occurs in the horse's trachea. So a few things about the normal horse. Horses are obligate nasal breathers. And what that means is, unlike you and I, when they need air at a run, they can only take it in through their nose. And so if you think about that, if you close your mouth and you grab your nose and you put your fingers over it and you breathe in through your nose, you can feel that tissue get sucked in. That's one area of the horse that causes resistance. What that does is, is because of the way the horse's anatomy is designed and it lacks bony structure, that tissue gets sucked in. And somebody sent me this picture of a very exaggerated horse. But if you look for it when the horse is in a flight phase, you'll see this. Then we look at the throat. And the photo on the left is a normal throat. And when you look in there, there are those two cartilages called the arytenoid cartilage. Below it, that black hole is the tube going down into the trachea, and below that is the epiglottis. Below that epiglottis is the horse's soft palate, and above it is part of the oropharynx. When those horses are pulling a lot of air in, and there's a lot of suction, if you look at the photo on the right, you don't see the arytenoid cartilages, do you? It's, it, it could be a better photo. This is from Dr. Ducharme at Cornell, um, but 
the negative pressure actually causes the tissue to pull down over the trachea and reduce the amount of air that can get in. So this isn't a normal horse that you have these type of issues. Now when you have problems in the upper airway, it makes it worse. And pro worse. Problems can come about due to trauma or infections or tumors, but really on the racetrack, there are three main conditions that you're gonna see in the upper respiratory system. The one in the right corner is called roaring. It's a paralysis of the nerve that innervates that arytenoid cartilage that should be causing those cartilages to open up. When that nerve gets paralyzed, it falls forward and the horse has a problem bringing air in. Down below on the left is what's called a dorsal displacement of the soft palate. And that means that soft palate flips up and it covers the epiglottis. What's important here is though the hole, the opening into the trachea has been reduced. And the one on the right is another situation called epiglottic entrapment where tissues that are, in, are surrounding the, air, the, um, the oral pharynx hooks over the epiglottis and again, it reduces the size of the opening to get air in. Most of these horses are gonna show up as poor performers. Fortunately, there are fairly well used surgical procedures that can bring these horses back to performance. Talk about the lower airways. When I talk about the lower airways, I'll talk about the lungs and the conditions that go on in the lungs. The lungs bring air in, and we'll talk about how they branch into these things called the alveoli, but the other important thing about the lungs is a muscle behind the lungs called the diaphragm, and those muscle, that muscle is what pulls the air in and helps bring air into the horse. Now, if you take the lungs out of a horse, they're pretty big, but there's a problem because unlike humans, when we breathe and you expand to bring air in, your chest and your rib cage expands. Horses do that too at a walk and a trot, but not when they're galloping. When they're galloping, their rib cage becomes rigid and they can't expand it anymore. And so that muscle, the diaphragm, is what's pulling the air in. So when we talk about horses like Secretariat that had a big heart, you gotta hope he had a big chest cavity because he has much less room for lungs. So as we breed big hearts, we get reduced lungs. So they only use about a third of the capacity that they have in there. The other thing is lungs don't train. When we start a young horse, oftentimes it's their bones and their muscles that are the limiting factor. But after we train them and we bring them up, the bones get more dense, the muscles are better able to deal with the work we're putting them through, but the lungs have not changed. What you get at the beginning is the same thing as you have at the end. So the goal with the lungs as any organ is keep them as healthy as possible. So what happens in this air exchange? What goes on in the lungs? If you look at the image on the right, air comes in a horse's nose, it goes down the trachea, and then when it gets into the lungs, it goes into all these branching tubes until at the end of it, there are these things called the alveoli. And that's where the oxygen that's in the air is gonna jump onto blood being carried in capillaries right next to it. So if you look at the little photo on the right, blue blood comes in, oxygen hops on, red blood goes back, oxygenated, goes back to the heart and gets pumped to the body. Now if you look at the photo on, or the image on the left, what it's trying to show is that on the left is this alveolus where air is coming in, and on the right are red blood cells in a capillary and the carbon dioxide and the oxygen change back and forth. And it's a really efficient system. Horses have an incredible aerobic capacity. If you take the surface area of a horse's lungs and you lay it out flat, it's about 10 tennis courts worth of space that is available for exchanging oxygen back and forth. The issue is this little membrane that the oxygen and carbon dioxide move back and forth across is pretty fragile and that brings its own issues. We talk about lower airway conditions, we talk about infections, typically bacteria, fungus, viruses, inflammatory airway disease, and then we'll talk a couple minutes about exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage, which may be timely after yesterday's discussions of LASIK. Um, inflammatory airway disease is the one that we deal with a lot because this is that kind of insidious condition. If you've got a horse with a viral infection, oftentimes they spike a fever, they run their course, and they're on their way. Bacterial infections, we're pretty competent at culturing, finding the right antibiotics, and moving them on. 
Inflammatory airway disease kind of lingers, and these horses can be silent, poor performers. And it was just in the last six months, I think, there was agreement that we're going to call this asthma. And there are two forms. It's like human asthma, chronic and acute. The thing we deal with in racehorses quite frequently is the, the acute form, which these horses may have a cough, they may not. They just perform poorly. But there are many things that cause it. Probably one of the biggest things we want to keep an eye on is management, uh, dust, pollution, those type of things that will create problems that cause those tubes in the airway to constrict and be narrow and make it more difficult to move air through. All right, now we're going to talk about exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage, which by definition is the presence of blood in the airways during or following exercise. And we hear about it an awful lot in thoroughbreds, but we've got to remember something. This isn't a thoroughbred condition. Barrel horses bleed. We just did a study where we just scoped horses. We found 80% of them had blood in the trachea. We have a hard time saying that when we just scope race horses. We see it in three-day event horses. We see it in endurance horses. Something happens when these animals exercise. The other thing is we, people think about it as, well, they get a bloody nose. About 5% of them ever show blood at the nose. This is a condition that occurs deep in the horse's lungs. Why? Well, when a horse starts to exercise, we said they bring in all this oxygen. They have to really create these suction forces to bring the air in. But on the other side, the horse has got this capability to contract its spleen and put a whole bunch more red blood cells in circulation so it can carry all this extra oxygen. But the heart rate goes up, too, to start moving this around the body. And that means the blood pressure goes up. And in the lungs, the blood pressure goes up about fourfold. They're pushing about 75 gallons of blood through their lungs every minute. So what's happening down in those little blood vessels? On the inside, you got a whole bunch of pressure pushing out. On the outside, you got suction pulling out. And that membrane fails. Oftentimes, fluid will just seep across, red blood cells seep across. In some cases, it's, it's a rupture. Well, what do we do about it? There is no miracle cure. As you can see, that's what fails, is that, that vessel. But all of these things up here play a role. We know that we can play with temperature and get horses to bleed more or less. We know we can move them to altitude. We know upper airway obstructions have a problem. So we hear things, there are only two things that have ever been shown to reduce bleeding repeatedly, the drug Lasix, nasal strips. But the thing that happens is nothing stops bleeding. Both of these are 65% or less effective. So what do you do with EIPH? We really have to look at just decreasing the level of bleeding. What we want to do is, is just keep it as low as possible. We want to reduce damage and overall help improve the performance performance. We've put horses on treadmills at a trot, 20, 20, um, 20 degree incline, 20 minutes, we get increased bleeding in them. So the thing we have to figure out is what's bad bleeding and what's not bad, bad bleeding. We know this is a leaky membrane. But we have to understand that when we think about how we're going to take care of this condition. So as far as the respiratory system, uh, it's important that you have a good respiratory system for oxygen transport. Um, it's, it's going to be a weak link in all horses. Upper and lower airway problems cause additional problems, and good attention and working with your veterinarian is critical to keeping the lungs healthy. That's all 